Tom Clark's 6M Podcast is a Boink Studios production. And now, on with the show. Hey, hey, what is up? Welcome to Tom Clark's 6M Podcast. I'm your host, Tom Clark, and in this episode, I'm joined by co-host Phil Lindsay. From the world of comic books comes a film about one of the most popular fan-favorite characters of all time, a being from another dimension who protects a world that's afraid of him, all while fighting the demon that lives within him. We're talking about Hellboy 2004. Hellboy was written and directed by Guillermo del Toro and was released in the United States on April 2nd, 2004. It was distributed by Sony Pictures. The film is based on characters and stories created by Mike Mignola and published by Dark Horse Comics. Hellboy debuted in Dime Press No. 4 in March of 1993. Hellboy begins during World War II in 1944, when the Nazis, working together with a mysterious Russian mystic named Grigory Rasputin, tap into another dimension in an effort to unleash a creature known as the Audru Jihad into the human world. But after the Allies discover the plan and attack, the portal opened by the Nazis is closed, leaving behind a small boy with an arm of stone. Trevor Brutenholm, a scientist working with the Allies, adopts the child and raises him as his son. The child grows to be Hellboy, a humanoid of immense strength and durability who becomes an object of modern folklore for a world that believes him to be nothing more than tabloid fodder. However, Hellboy is working as an agent for the government task force known as the BPRD, the Bureau for Paranormal Research and Defense. The BPRD maintains law and order, keeping supernatural threats away from the general public, but when Grigori returns and their enemies unite against them, it's up to Hellboy and the crew to stop them. Hellboy received rave reviews from critics and earned nearly $100 million on a budget of $60 million. The film spawned a sequel in 2008 and a franchise reboot in 2019. Thanks to the story, the action, and the characters, Hellboy remains one of the most popular comic book films of all time. And that's the lowdown on Hellboy 2004. If you are familiar with the 6M Podcast, then you know, yes, we cover comic books here. Marvel's one of the M's. We've covered DC quite a bit. We've even covered other publishers. We have talked about The Rocketeer, which is not Marvel or DC. Um, uh, any opportunity we can take to talk about, and again, it doesn't have to be comic book related, what we cover here, kids, but it's something that usually I'm into uh, and or my co-host is into, and we just go ahead and roll with that particular topic for that particular episode. So it's pretty exciting when we can get into a property that's neither Marvel nor DC um, nor um, Image, right? That's actually a contender and has made some money. And that's what we're getting into here today. Dark Horse Publishers, right? Dark Horse Comics. Uh, Hellboy. And yes, as you can see by the title of the episode here, this is Hellboy. We're calling this one Hellboy 2004. Just so everyone knows that we're not talking about the remake that happened, uh, what, 15 years later, I think? Insane. Uh, we'll get to that, kids. Never you fear, uh, in very short order. But in the meantime, we're going to dive into this here today. This is Hellboy, of course, as we said, 2004. Uh, this stars Ron Perlman in the title role. And yeah, I'm anxious to dive, to dive into this. Because, Phil, I don't think you and I have ever really talked about Hellboy, either off mic or on mic, honestly. And it's kind of one of those comic book films that tends to, I don't know about you, I tend to forget about it. Um, but I was reminded after watching again for a long time that I do enjoy this film quite a bit. I do think it has its issues, which we'll get in here to today. Um, but going into this episode, what's your overall view of Hellboy and how long has it been since you've seen it? I haven't seen the original movie in a long time. Um, it's one of those movies that it was on TV a lot. Uh, like FX used to play it constantly. Um, and so I used to see it a lot. Uh, but I haven't seen it in, in years. Uh, like even when I think about it, this movie came out in 2004. And yeah, I feel like around that time, it was everywhere. Uh, but yeah, um, but as far as Hellboy as a character... Um, I would argue that Hellboy and just Mike Mignola 
Like they're that this is one of the most influential creator owned comics there is. Like I feel like it changed everything in the early nineties, um, for creators. Um, because for a long time it was just seen as such a uh it would just seem as such such a big aspiration for people to work for one of the big two. Um and I think that, you know, stuff like the success of uh Dark Horse and later the success of Image really showed that uh, you could create your own property somewhere else and have success off of it. Oh, absolutely. And, and, you know, these days the, the idea of independent creators everywhere. Yeah. Um, and you know, dude, you could honestly say, and this, this is post image. We should clarify that this is post image in terms of this film, but Hellboy himself um, comes from that era of, like you said, creator owned, not one of the big publishers. Dude, you're a creator. How important is it to you, this idea of this is mine, I own this, I own the IP, I say what happens to it, you can't do anything without my consent. Does that matter to you more than, say, creating something for a very lucrative, lucrative financial uh, company that can pay you a million dollars? Or does it mean more to you to have, to own all the rights to whatever you create? Um. It's tough because I think a lot of us, um, especially if you're a comic fan and uh, you enjoy drawing like I did, um, a lot of us, you know, learned how to draw things from comics by drawing like our favorite stuff. Like a lot of the reason I uh, ever picked up a pencil and tried to learn how to draw was comic books and, you know, trying to draw Spider-Man. Like I I would draw Spider-Man stuff constantly. Um, And so... Yeah, of course. That's like a dream gig to be able to draw Spider-Man comics for a living. Um, and I think a lot of creators feel the same way that um, they grew up reading these things. And, you know, for better or worse, it influenced their writing or drawing style. And so, of course, like the dream is to be able to do it for a living. Um, but I think there's also something so cool about creating something of your own and it turning into a success story. I mean, uh, when you look at one of the most influential comic guys of the last decade and, and, and Brian Bendis, um, yes, he's one of the guys that turned uh, Avengers into a household name. And yes, he did all these great things like uh, Luke Cage and Ultimate Spider-Man and all these other great, great, uh, great new characters he created for Marvel. Um, but he started as an indie guy. Um, whether that be with uh, uh, Jinx, and uh goldfish and stuff like that um and didn't so, he do powers or am i thinking of somebody else wasn't powers his was powers his oh why am i drawing a blank i keep thinking oming oming drew blower that powers right um who was right on the powers ah, i might have be been wrong. it might have been bendis i'm just drawing a blank um but yeah when you think about bendis i think that a big part of his success, um, yes, Bendis did write powers. Um, nice. But yeah, when you think about a big part of his success, some of it is his creator own stuff. But I think he has also had a very influential career at Marvel. Uh, so, and I mean, he's also done stuff with DC. But yeah, it's, it's tough for me to say because I think everybody's going to have that struggle at some point because I think they just asked Mignola. Uh, about what he thought about the latest um, Daredevil reboot. And of course he has no say in it because he doesn't own the film rights. He only owns like the film, the rights to it as a comic. So there's always going to be a part of it where you're left out of the room as a creator. That's just how these big corporate situations work. <laughs> um, but yeah, I can't imagine how rewarding that must feel to have something that you created completely from scratch to turn into this, massive success i think that i would i would enjoy that more but again if you are giving me the keys to the kingdom to draw like avengers comics or do something like that i'm not going to turn it down (laughs) oh no not at all and i'm sitting here thinking about creator-owned ip again characters that don't belong to either of the two big publishers um and of course as we said images creator owned i mean you know, you have to say the most successful of the past 20 years has got to be Robert Kirkman. It's got to be him. I mean, his, you know, as if The Walking Dead wasn't big enough. He's got other projects in the works, in the works 
he didn't have a publisher telling him what to do or how to do it. It was up to him. And then he was approached and, and, you know, the rest is history. The Walking Dead is a cultural phenomenon in this country and really all over the world. But Invincible is his. He now yeah. has a second creator-owned property he can hang his hat on, which is excellent, by the way. I mean, so you'd have to say maybe of this current generation, he's the guy. But like, yeah. I mean, dude, where do you hold Mike Manola in, in terms of the the impact he's made with Hellboy? He's got to be up there in the top 10 of, you know, creator-owned IP, doesn't he? Yeah, I think if you're doing like a Mount Rushmore of creator own guys, like I feel like it has to be Kirkman, like you said, probably Bendis, uh, Mignola, probably Garth Ennis. Mm. Um, yeah, yeah, I feel like it had to be those four guys because Garth, I feel like you know, with the success he's had of the boys and like uh, other things like uh, Preacher and all these other things, I feel like he he is definitely one of those big names as well that managed to make a creator own project into something big. Uh, I'm probably missing somebody else out of the four, but I feel like they are the four big ones of like this era. Yeah, I would agree with that. Um, you know, the character of Hellboy, if you look at it from a distance, I mean, the movies did a lot to help him look really, really cool. But at any given time in the books, if you don't know what this is, you may... I mean, it's not that he doesn't look cool, but he's not the the typical, uh, I guess I'll call him hero or anti-hero, whatever it is you want to call him. But man, and we'll get into it here with Perlman, but dude, they just made him look so good and like there's parts of this uh, the the costume still looks good like the the you know it's, it's the prosthetics still look fine um i'll be honest with you the prosthetics and the remake are not terrible but huh. david harbour's face is not great there's just something about it's not working and honestly in one of the opening scenes of that film he's as they do in this film he is, he has a, uh, like a trimmer and he's trimming down the horn, one of the horns and the horn on the prosthetics the the, the stub is moving back and forth uh, on his ah, forehead. That's It's, v- it's visible. And I thought, how did you not catch this? The editing process, man. <laughs> wow. Yeah. What do you think about Perlman in this? How does he look to you? I mean, uh, honestly, do, if you saw this guy in broad daylight, would you say, all right, this is ridiculous. Or do you think it looks pretty good? Uh, I, I, it's weird because I do think that, uh, I think that he almost looks too good. Like, I feel like, uh, one of the things that people had an issue with, with the star Wars prequels is everything looked too clean. And, um, just rewatching the movie, I do think Hellboy looks just too perfect at times. Like, just the skin is just unscathed. Like, there's certain parts where it, like, they'll put like little scratches on him, and like he's he's shown blood in it. But, um, I think a big part of the appeal from the comic is that he is he's a demon and he's a very scraggly looking demon. Like, he's not <laughs> he's not visually appealing. Um, but I, I feel like, uh, they make him as, uh, visually appealing in the, in the movies as possible. And I know that's a part of movie making. You got to make this guy marketable. You want to see him on the front of, uh, all this merchandise. Um, but if that's one of my critiques about it is that he almost looks too good. <laughs> Which, I, I think the hair looks too good, you know? Yeah. Everything about him, he just looks too well kept at some point for this character. And I don't know. I think once you see him in the comics, and it's kind of hard to see him without the goat legs. <laughs> mm, yeah, yeah. Um, and I don't. Again, I don't want to be one of those, you know, comic book guys of you know adjusting my glasses. Well, you know, why doesn't he have? <laughs> why doesn't he have the goat legs? Why is he? He's too tall. Like, <laughs> um, but no, I think he looks really good in the movie, and I think that Perlman is very good in the role. He's very likable. Um, he's much more likable than the actual character is in the, in the book. Cause mm. in the book, he's very standoffish at times. He's very brooding and stoic. Yeah. Um, and Perlman is a lot more, a lot funnier. He's doing a lot of wisecracking. Um, so it's almost like a different character. Like they look the same, but personality wise, it's not really the same character. Yeah. That's a good call. Um, had you, had you been a Hellboy fan before the movie hit? Had you followed him in the comics at all? 
Uh, no, I I had like some experience with the character. Like I had like certain single issue stuff that I would get from like Free Comic Book Day or something that I collected. But uh, after the movies, I started uh, reading a lot of the trades, uh, and that's really how I got into the books. I mean, just imagine the the business that this character did after that movie was released. This this guy was a uh, <laughs> at because I feel like there's there's two periods when you um, discover comics. Like I feel like either you were a uh, you were a rat guy that found them at like a Seven Eleven or something, or you're a mm-hmm. Barnes and Noble era. And I feel like during the Barnes and Noble era, where everybody read trade check paperbacks, Hellboy was a big deal because those trades were everywhere. I am a rat guy. Uh, I'm old, very old, old school on my comic books, man. Spinner racks. I mean, wall racks. Yeah, no doubt about it. That's how I was. In fact, in a town I used to live in uh, a couple hours from here, we had a, a corner, like a convenience store on the corner. We call it the curb market. It was right on the curb. And it was like a, a throwback kind of newsstand. It was a storefront, like garage door that opened up. And there was like stacks of newspapers. It makes it sound like the 50s, what I'm telling you here. It was like newspapers and soda and stuff. And <laughs> doesn't it sound like, how you doing there, pal? I'll take a, I'll take a newspaper there and, and, a, and a Coke. But uh, no, it wasn't, wasn't yeah. nuts. But they one, had one malt, please. Con- yes, one malt. <laughs> one, one malt and an and a issue of Action Comics, please. Yes, issue of Action <laughs> Comics. That'll be a nickel. Yeah. But they uh, had, uh, they, float. had <laughs> they had uh, uh, a, a rack and a wall rack of comics. And when I'm like a kid, not even a teenager yet, me and a buddy of mine uh, would walk there and it was like ha- halfway across town and we'd walk there and just, man, we'd both spend all of our allowance on these books, man. Uh, it's just so cool. And it wasn't that long ago. Certainly wasn't the fifties, but man, some days I feel it. Um, yeah, uh, it's weird because I I kind of experienced both because I I didn't have the money to collect comics when I was a kid, um, so I would just kind of every time I would see comics, I would either beg beg my my mom to buy me one, or I would take the money I had and you know get as many of them I could. But I didn't follow stories ongoing because I just didn't have the money to do it. Mm-hmm. Um, and once I started reading comics regularly, like way later, um, I was firmly in the Barnes and Noble era where that was kind of the way some people read comics that, you know, at this point um, it wasn't just a bunch of people huddled together in comic book stores. And that was their experience. Uh, No, it was like more of a mainstream thing that, and like even the Barnes and Noble era, it just feels dated now because there aren't many Barnes and Nobles anymore. (laughs) Like the day of the bookstore is kind of over. But for sure in college, like that was how a lot of people um, discovered comics like could they would go and buy the graphic novels or the trade paperbacks yeah i mean it's you're dude you're at that age where you kind of had the best of both worlds like a little bit of one little bit of the other so that's all good yeah Um, i i was actually also there for the digital comic boom and just being able to have like an entire library of comics at your fingertips which just seems like it was crazy at my age as a kid i would have loved that like are you kidding me? Like getting like a comicsology account, like at, at then I would have loved that. Yeah, because you 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 know, I'm I'm so split on that because I do have a comicsology account and it's loaded up with a bunch of stuff. But I just I love to read them. I really do, and yeah. I love the stories. But like, dude, there is nothing like holding a comic in your hands. Yeah, really I feel is. the same way. Like I, um. When Marvel started uh, doing the putting the codes in the comics and you can have the physical issue and like download the code into your uh, into the app, um, that was cool for like long trips. So I didn't have to lug a lot of books with me and I could just have like all of it on my tablet. Um, That's cool. Like that's a convenient thing. But yeah, it's just um, if you're just a old school comic fan like we are, it's nothing like having the books in your hand and like being able to turn the pages like. I, I don't know. I don't care how many times like you see stuff on a screen, like turning a page and getting to a big splash page does not feel the same. No, not at all. And I, <laughs> I think I've said this on a previous episode. I, I, I smell the book when I open it. I, I don't, to this day I do it. It's just habit. I, I love the smell of the old paper because it instantly, yeah. dude, it instantly takes me back to being a kid 
And it's just like, especially if a book is older than I am, it's especially cool to me. Like, ah, uh, yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm, no. Unless you're a comic book fan, you don't, you don't get it, right? You don't understand what it means. Yeah. I, I just think that stuff like cliffhangers don't read the same. Like getting to that last page of something hmm. and like being like in awe of like the last page of the book that you're like have this great cliffhanger on. It just doesn't feel the same. Um, like it doesn't feel the same, like turning it, turning the page to it, like you scrolling to get to it. Does It just doesn't feel the same to me. And that could be just a mind thing. I don't know. Just a nostalgia thing. I don't know. Yeah, no, you're right. Um, yeah, it's, uh, it's just, there's just something about it. Like I, I went, I took a, my nephew to a, uh, a very small comic book convention a few days ago. And I only, I only left with like three or four books, old defenders issue. I'm still on my kick of trying to collect the entire run of the defenders. So I left with like three or four books, but like, I wasn't even going to buy myself anything, but I just, you know, you get in there and you look around, you can't help it. Um, yeah. We got to dive into this film and I know you haven't, you haven't seen the remake or not remake, but I should say reboot. By the way, it didn't have to be a reboot kids. It could have just been another story. Uh, yeah. And they, they could have just done that. And it would have been totally fine. It didn't have to be a part three. It could have just been, it could have just been another story, but they just didn't go that way. And it's whatever. But just so everyone out there listening knows how this works. Um, the, the Hellboy that we're reviewing today on the show here, the 2004 original film release has an aggregate review on Rotten Tomatoes of 81%. Wow. And yeah. And just by sheer coincidence there, Phil, the 2004, excuse me, the 2019 uh, reboot with David Harbour has 81 also, if you invert the numbers. So yes, (laughs) (laughs) isn't that funny? 18%. 18%. Wow. Um, yeah, nuts. Uh, we've mentioned Ron Perlman. Ron Perlman was born to play Hellboy. I don't even want to talk about who could have been because I don't care. Robert Downey was born to play Tony Stark. I mean, you know, Ron Perlman is born to play Hellboy. I, I just, we can go down the list of people that we believe are born to play a character. I mean, dude, yeah. what more can you say about Perlman that hasn't already been said? He's perfect in this role. Um, yeah, I just think he's one of those guys in the early 2000s and like the real, the really the formative era of comic book movies where they became the rave again, where he was one of the biggest stars so much that when he got recast, I felt bad for him because he was campaigning for Hellboy three for so long. Mm -hmm. And I feel like the studio kind of did him wrong by rebooting and just not involving him in any way. Uh, yeah, it, And I mean, I think it's just because we had such a connection to him, not just because of Hellboy, but I feel like he's one of those guys connected to comic book media where he's been he's been cast in so many things, um, so many different comic book movies. Uh, He's done voice acting in so many comic book uh, properties. I mean, Clayface in the the Batman uh, Batman animated series. He's like a legend. Oh yeah, for sure. And uh, I just again, I, the trench coat, the gun, the horns, the tail. I mean, it's just. Yeah. What more can you say about it? It's so good, man. Yeah, the, one of the visual things I think that they nailed in this movie is the the look with the with the full horns and the flaming crown. It just looks so cool. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's one of those things that they could have easily messed it up from the comic, but it looks so good on screen. Yes, it does, actually. And uh, again, David Harbour's version does not look bad. If I haven't said it here, maybe I haven't. He doesn't look bad. But but again, the face is a is a is a is a miss for me. The body, to your point, the body's not perfect. The body is scarred. The body is hairy. The body is, you know, you can tell. But it also feels like there's an actor walking around with a big fake arm. (laughs) <laughs> uh, you know, and, and they both are obviously, but like, yeah. it just felt, it felt really like that in the David Harbour version. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I think at some points, um, Hellboy looks very clean in this version. And again, I don't want to nitpick on it. Uh, but I think that's one of my knocks that it, it, at some points it looks like he's made out of rubber cause he's just so clean and so perfect. Mm. Yeah. 
Good call. Um, John Hurt as Trevor Trevor Buttonholm. Brut Bruttenholm, excuse me. John Hurt, one of the great actors of all time. And honestly, this is a far cry from how he looked in Alien. Obviously, a lot of time has passed, but holy Lord, he's almost unrecognizable here. But dude, he brings class. He brings, and it's not it's not just because of the accent, kids. It's just the way he carries himself. Um, and I, you know, jumping around insanely quick here. But in his death scene, when he just turns around and he says, I'm ready, uh, I'm ready to go, whatever. And, you know, Rasputin just just kind of whispers, I'll make it quick. And, dude, there was something eerily honorable in that death. Like, Rasputin respected him. And this guy's like a demon or whatever he is. I mean, he's otherworldly, <laughs> right? But <laughs> Nazi... Yes. Uh, mystic or whatever he is. <laughs> but he gave this old man an honorable death, a very quick, very painless. I mean, I don't know. There was something about that moment that kind of said, this is not a typical smash em up action film. These characters are a little bit more complex than what you might think. But what is, what about John Hurt as Trevor in this film? What do you think? I think he's great. I think he brings the right gravitas to the character, um, especially in a character where, I mean, in a movie where it seems like a lot of the tone is kind of more cartoonish than we what we came to expect from the books. Mm -hmm. And I feel like he's one of the characters in this thing that grounds it in, the, in reality. He's one of the characters that feels very real. Um, and I think that, you know, the movie... I won't say that the second movie kind of suffers without him, but it definitely misses him. Mm. Agreed. Dude, I remember as, as I watched the death scene, I remembered being in the theater when I watched the film and there was an audible gasp from the audience. And that's how you know that the guy on camera or on the screen has got him hooked. Like, you know, he has you hooked when you can hear the audience sort of, Maybe not weeping, but just that sound like, oh, no, not him. I mean, it was such a cool moment. Like, yeah, he brought it and then some. Um, what about Selma Blair as Liz Sherman? I got mixed thoughts on this. I want to get your take. What do you think about it first? Oh, it's so it's so hard because uh, when I initially saw the movie, I didn't see any real problem with her in the movie. Uh, but when you read the books and you find out more about Liz as a character. Like she is basically a different character. Like um, the the character in the books is just so much better. Um, and I don't want to hold that against Selma because she doesn't do anything other than, you know, work with the material that she's given. But man, I just felt like they did that character such a disservice. Uh, and I mean, depending on what you think about the love interest stuff as well, yeah, um, I don't think that Selma Blair is a bad actress, though. I think she, I've enjoyed her in a lot of things, um, and she's good here doing what she what what she's given to do. But it's just so distracting once you know what the character is like in the book. I I I agree with everything you said. I and and I don't think she's wrong for the part. I just to your point, I think it's the way it's written. She was very emo she was very distraught she's very introverted she's very quiet she's very reserved yeah. and there's she's, moments where it took me out of the film man yeah she's very meek here um you don't get the idea how powerful she is in the in the book like she's one of the most powerful characters in the brp pd in the book um like all the way to the point that like i think the movie also makes hellboy seems like the heavy hitter of the, the, the entire uh, organization. Um, when really, there were a lot of people there that could hold their own without him. Um, and Liz is one of them. And you just don't get that idea in the movies at all. Uh, but again, I don't want to turn that into a gripe of, you know, how they didn't get things right and how it's not as close to the comic as I want it to be. Um, but I definitely think that was one of the failings of the, the, the two movies is that you don't really get an idea of how how big that organization is and 
like how there are other teams outside of Hellboy that sol- solve crimes without him. We'll solve yeah. mysteries without him. Oh, no, yeah, for sure. I get it. Yeah. Um, well done. Uh I, I I didn't want to flip too quick, but I, I just I'm looking at his name and we gotta talk about him because he's like sort of the third say he's the third main character of this film, Rupert Evans as Agent Myers. <laughs> um I think he's actually really perfect. He's clean cut, clean shaven, innocent to a point, and you don't really know how good he is until way later in the film when he kind of shows he's kind of fearless, which you kind of don't expect that from this guy at all. What do you think about John Myers portrayed by Rupert Evans? Um, I like the Myers character. The Myers character, of course, is a character exclusive to the movies. Mm -hmm. Um, And I mean, again, that's one of those things, depending on how much you love the books that how much you're going to eye roll at it. Uh, But I think when you do paranormal stuff and you do fantastical stuff, you always have to give the audience uh, their point of view in the movie, the guy that Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, is is fresh to these things. And that's the person that you can give all the exposition to and explain all these things to, because it's all new to them. And as a new agent coming in, he works perfectly. He's a good character um, to be surprised by all these things and do all of these reveals with, um, I don't really bump into him not being a good character so much so that in the second movie it's distracting that he's not there. It's like, cause he's such a big part of the first movie. It's like, okay, well where's Myers? Like, uh, and they just give you a throwaway line too of, Oh, well he got reassigned cause Hellboy was still jealous of him. But I'm like, okay. (laughs) There's a lot of that movie that doesn't feel right to be honest. Yeah. We won't get into the duet scene. (laughs) Oh God, help us all! Uh, yeah, no doubt. Yeah, I I thought he was kind of really good, really perfect in this for his role. And you're 100 percent right. What you said, the audience needs a way in. Uh, and I kind of totally get that. I I I believe maybe Trevor could have been the way in, but it's okay that he's not. Um, yeah. I get where they were going for. I didn't lose too much sleep over it. Yeah, you you kind of need that fish out of water character to be there. Um, to have the same experience as the audience. Mm-hmm. Um, let's see. Karel, Karel Roden as Gregory Rasputin, as we just mentioned earlier. This guy is all kinds of creepy, all kinds of evil. But yet, there again, there's a level of... Honor's not the right word. There's a level of something to this character that I can't quite put my finger on. That yes, you know he's the antagonist. Yes, of course you know he's evil. But I love that he's not a shouting, maniacal, mustache-twirling villain. That stuff's okay in small doses. I don't like it for a full two-hour movie, dude. There's something about it's just it's too much. I, it just takes me out of the moment. And this film is already supernatural and hard to believe as it is. If he had been over the top, I don't know if this movie works. I thought he was understated, and to me that equals awesome. What do you think about Rasputin in this movie? Uh, yeah, I think a lot of early days of comic book movies, and even sometimes now, um, we get a lot of the hammy villain characters that's doing a lot of the long-winded monologues that is trying to uh, one-up a lot of the roles we've seen before, whether that be a Joker or you know a lot of these other uh, iconic comic book villains. And I think that this guy did a good job because he didn't try to be larger than the source material. If that makes sense. Mm -hmm. I feel like he fit perfectly here. Um, I feel like he was eerie when he needed to be. I felt like he was, uh, I feel like he had a cool look. I think the first time we see him in present day, um, he just brings a presence to the script, to the scenes he's in. Um, I, I liked him. I liked him a lot. Yeah, I I think he was, um, very much fitting the role. I just thought he was fantastic. He just looks like a Shakespearean actor to me through this whole film. That's what I feel like I'm watching as a stage production, but it's not like we said. It's not over the top. It's not too much. It's just right. Um, another member of the BPRD, 
is Doug Jones as Abe Sapien. And dude, I don't know how I didn't know this. I did not realize that David Hyde Pierce is the voice of Abe Sapien. So there you go. Oh, I, uh, did, I didn't notice that. I didn't know that. He, he's uncredited, by the way, in the film. Got no credit in the uh, in the notes there. But uh, Doug Jones is... Man, this dude. <laughs> so, okay. I think we can, maybe you'll agree with this. You put the wrong guy in a Hellboy suit. This film's a flop. hundred yes. percent. Okay. Um, by the same token, you put the wrong guy in the Abe Sapien suit. Also, this film, perhaps a flop. Doug Jones plays this thing like a regular dude walking around. He plays it straight. He doesn't play it like he's... I mean, he crawls around and he uses the hands and squats, but it's nothing too much. Dude, I don't know what the direction was for this character, but in terms of this movie, I thought he was fantastic. It kind of feels like he could walk into the room with you and you wouldn't be freaked out because he's just, that's not the performance he's giving. He makes this character as crazy as it sounds. He makes it as relatable as he can. And it honestly feels like a human walking around, dude. What do you think about Abe Sapien? Uh, yeah, and I mean, again, if you're pairing two guys that are like legends when it comes to like genre films and all of the stuff that Doug Jones has been linked to, I feel like that's a part of what makes Hellboy um, so much so likable to us as fans because it's like when I think Doug Jones, like I think all of the things he's been attached to throughout his career, uh, whether that be uh, Hocus Pocus, uh, like uh, all of these random things that you could think that this guy has starred in uh uh i'm of course drawing a blank because now i have to think about his catalog at uh, tank girl uh mm -hmm. just like all across the board things this guy has been attached to um that like you this guy is essentially like a legend like if you know you know kind of guy um and so it's it's cool to see him get a part in this and again i didn't even think about that's not his voice but yeah, then it, when you when you say it when you say it's David Hyde Pierce, it's like, well, yeah, yeah, of course it is. Um, um, but yeah, I love his look in this thing. I think that uh, they did a great job with the prosthetics for Abe. Um, he's another character where he is drastically different than the books. Um, mm -hmm. But I think he works here. I think that all of the visuals for him look great. Um, when we first see him in the tank, he looks great. Um, but he's again one of those guys that he's a lot more competent in a book. Like we see him like shooting and killing people. <laughs> you don't really mm, see yeah. him. You don't really see him do anything um, offensive in any of these any of the movies. Like he's kind of like a supporting character for most of the franchise. Yeah, when he gets trapped underwater by Samuel, dude, that is frightening because you're like, oh my god, they're gonna kill him. I mean, that was who. That was intense. Yeah. Oh yeah, that those scenes are great because it's like, again, we he he seen as so helpless for most of the movie, um, uh, that it's like, oh man, is he really gonna die? It it makes everybody feel like they need Hellboy, they have to rely on him, and in some ways, um, I don't like that as a fan of the books, but at the same time, I do think that it created suspense. Yeah, yeah, oh yeah, for sure. You know, it's funny. For some reason, I thought this was Alan Tudyk as the voice. And I can't tell you why I thought that. Another another legend when it comes to like genres. Like when you think of like comic book fans and just like that guy that you can see on a guest list for a Comic-Con, you're always going to see a guy like, like Doug Jones or Alan Tudyk. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um uh, let's see. So also in this cast, um, and this is sort of rounding out the main cast, I should say, Jeffrey Tambor, who we talked about in the Hangover films, uh, uh, the uh, the trilogy trilogy that we that we that we done earlier in the show or earlier in the podcast, as Tom Manning, dude, he gets on your nerves. He is the typical seventies uh, captain in the detective. In the police squad, right? He's a, and he's he's trying to wrangle in the the the, the smart mouth cop, and you know it, it's almost like you have to have this authority figure in every kind of movie like this. But by the end, you kind of like him too. Like 
Jeffrey Tambor is so good in everything he does, man. What do you think about him here? Yeah, I think he's great. I think he's great as a as a foil for a Hellboy. Um, and I think your analogy is perfect. I think if uh, this is a t- detective movie and we're supposed to follow Hellboy as this uh, <laughs> this this guy that always wants to break the rules and take things too far, of course the Manning character is the guy that's that's getting irritated with everything he does and has to chew this guy out and rein him in. So good. I love him. He's so good in this. I mean, plus, you know, the guy's a comedic actor anyway, which I think you got to have a little touch of that here. So it works. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I always, every time I think about this movie, I always think of when he saves him and he goes to like the cigar and he's like, what are you doing? You can't light a cigar with a, yeah. a lighter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You got to, you got to preserve, uh, preserve the flavor with the wooden match. Yeah. And Hellboy looks at him and says, thank you. And he goes, thank you. And it was just his nice way of saying, okay, you totally saved my life. Sorry, I'm a jerk. You know, as that, that one little moment kind of redeemed the character for the whole film, I think. I was like really happy that he didn't get killed, even though they left his fate up in the air. Did you know there was a mid credit scene for that film? Did you know that? Yeah, where he's just like, guys, I'm still here. <laughs> <laughs> I can't say I knew that till I watched it back. I'm like, oh my God, I forgot about that. Or maybe I didn't know it to begin with. I don't know. Tom Clark 6M Podcast is sponsored in part by Radius Law Group. Every day, Radius helps individuals, families, small businesses, and nonprofit organizations throughout North Carolina, Florida, and Pennsylvania resolve their legal issues by providing effective legal counsel in the areas of estate planning, as well as elder law and Medicaid. Radius Law holds the radical belief that working with a lawyer can indeed be enjoyable. So give them a call at 1-800-519-5667 for more information and tell them that Tom Clark 6M Podcast sent you. Well, there you have it, kids. There's your uh, main cast. There's other there's other members. Corey Johnson as Agent Clay is here. Brian Casp as Agent Lime. James Babson as Agent Moss. Stephen Fisher as Agent Corey. William Holland as General Klaus von Krupp. Oh, here's a character that I, I kind of totally, not kind of, I totally left off. Carl Ruprecht Cronin. This guy. Phil is one of the creepiest villains I think we've ever seen, maybe ever. I mean, he's such such an outlandish character that you would only see in a comic book movie, though, because he's like a he's like a Nazi mummy ninja zombie. (laughs) Like, yes, like, like we really think of him. Like, what is he? He's like. He's like a Nazi, and he has like the, all of the formal Nazi uh, wear early in the movie, and then later he's just kind of like a, almost like a ninja character that you would see in like GI Joe or something. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's so it's so ridiculous, but he's so great. Yeah, I. Uh, it's yeah, ninja's right because every time he like he puts the suit back on, the mask back on, he's got that sword, and he's like. I don't know, man. It's it's just messed up. It just looks like um, uh, uh, was it Ray Park that played Darth Maul? That's what it reminds me of. <laughs> yeah, man, he is definitely one of the coolest parts of this movie. Like all of his choreography for his fights is cool. He does several really cool things with those, like, uh, like they're like swords, but they're like almost nightsticks. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, um, yeah, but just everything about his character is bizarre. Like I said, he's essentially a, a zombie. <laughs> he's, cause he's he's like dead under the suit, and he's just like all of his all of his body flu- bodily fluids are dust. <laughs> I know, right? Isn't that odd? Like, how is he? I, I like how um, um, uh, Trevor was asking what keeps a like what keeps a creature like this alive. Like, I don't know if we ever got an answer to that. But there again, we're having to. You know, just assume that this Rasputin guy is still alive after all these years and he's tapped into the power, like the occult and like the Nazis and all that stuff. Yeah. I mean, that's another, this is another character. Uh, I don't want to sound like a broken record here, but he's drastically different from the comic. His look is different in the comics. Um, uh, he doesn't really fight the same way. Like uh, he has a gas mask and stuff that, that all looks the same. 
Um, but yeah, uh, he's definitely one of the most visually interesting characters in the in the movie, and he works perfectly as like this um, henchman for Rasputin that does mm-hmm. like kind of the comic book trope stuff at the time. Like I feel like at that time. There was always the henchman character that did all of the cool stuff like this that could beat everybody up that looked unbeatable. Like that was a that was like Death Strike in X two where she was just like super cool, never spoke. Like it always has to be like this mute character that can do all of these cool action set mm. scenes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, for sure. Uh, listen, we didn't even we haven't even mentioned the man behind the scenes. Guillermo del Toro as a, I mean, a, 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 he's the director. He's the guy that without this, without him, none of this happens. I mean, when you, I don't know about you, but when I think of this guy, I typically he's mentioned in like hushed tones. Like he is such a respected, uh, you know, filmmaker and I'm not disputing that at all. Uh, but at the same time, when you look at his, his filmography, I mean, he's got some he's got some interesting choices in there, but like, what does he have in his filmography that tells you this guy is utterly amazing? And I'm not disputing that he's not good, but like, you look, he's got he began in '93 with Kronos, '97 was Mimic, 2001 is The Devil's Backbone. He did Blade Two, yep. Hellboy, Pan's Labyrinth, uh, Labyrinth, Hellboy Two, Pacific Rim. Crimson Peak, The Shape of Water, Nightmare Alley, and most recently Pinocchio. That's his that's his entire filmography, Phil, but it feels as though maybe it's the name, maybe it's his reputation, but dude, it almost feels like no disrespect to him. It almost feels like his reputation is bigger than his career. Am I crazy? Uh I just think that he's one of those guys that um I wanna say he feel he feels like like what you what you think like a genre filmmaker is like, he's so good at bringing these things to life. He's so good at uh, the visual styles. Like I feel like he is in a lot of ways, what people believe Zack Snyder is. Uh, I don't want that to sound like a shade, but I feel like Del Terrell is so good at like doing fantastical stuff. Cause I feel like when you think of like Pan's Labyrinth, like that's just such a visually pleasing movie. And like even Blade Two, Blade Two is just so different from the first movie. Like just the visuals, just like the the tone of it, the world building he does. He's just so good at that kind of stuff. Uh, he's one of those guys that you would bring up in the conversations, like the Peter Jackson of the world, that just like has a vision. And I feel like that's why he's respected. That's a hundred percent fair, and I love the Peter Jackson comparison. Actually, it makes a heck of a lot of sense. I dig that. Um, let's talk about the plot here, uh, sort of the overall plot. So yes, kids, as Phil mentioned, there's some really bad Nazis. Never met a good one. Have you, uh, Nazis tend to be yeah. bad. Go yeah. figure. Yeah. I'm sorry. If, if you're one of those Mar- Americans that needs to be reminded, Nazis are the bad guys. They're yes. the bad guys. Yes. Then now and always. Yes. Always. They so. are the bad guys. Those are the guys that. Your grandparents when bought comics to see Captain America punch them in the face. They're always Absolutely. the bad guys. Always punch Absolutely. a Nazi. <laughs> Absolutely. In fact, I have maintained for years that I have I have I have assembled the perfect villain. It's a villain that everybody can get behind when the good guy kills him. And we can all stand up and shout in the theater when it happens. And that's undead Nazi ninja. I think that that right there is perfect because it's all three things you can totally hate at the same time. And yeah, that guy needs to die. So there you go. Until the undead Nazi ninjas hit, Phil, we just got the good old Nazis. Yeah. uh, Yeah. Nazis are always the bad guys. Don't ever let anybody tell you differently. Absolutely. Uh, So in 1944, as the plot goes, with the help of Russian mystic, and that was the aforementioned Grigory Rasputin, the Nazis build a dimensional portal off the coast of Scotland and intend to free the Ogdru Jihad. That's right, to aid them in defeating the Allies. So basically what you have here is a bunch of wacky Nazis, hence the bad guys. Uh, they are foiled in their plans by the Allies. Go America! Uh, <laughs> with <laughs> Trevor's there, the young Trevor, by the way, who we did not give props to, and the gentleman that played young Trevor is really, really good. 
uh, because it just, he does exactly what he needs to do. Um, <laughs> I don't know if it's just me, but every time I hear the name Trevor, I think of Fresh Prince of Bel-Air and I just think of Will Smith whispering, Trevor. <laughs> I wasn't thinking about them, but I will now, for sure. Uh, Kevin Trainer played young Trevor and did excellent job. Actually, I think you could have put that guy and and aged him up, and he would have been fine. And I mean, John Hurt's great, of course, but I'm just saying. Uh, so basically, Phil, what we have here is, of course, the Nazis are doing Nazi stuff. They get defeated, but in the in the process of this of them trying to tap in this other dimension. Hellboy as a child shows up and kids spoiler alert. The remake is kind of the same plot because they just want to be Hellboy. They want Hellboy to just be Hellboy and I guess become hell man as it were. Hell man. Um, yeah. So dude, same question as, as every movie review we do, I'll throw it to you here. You know, it's coming. What's your take on the plot? Does this plot make sense? I mean, yeah, there's a lot of stuff you have to swallow with the extra dimensional stuff. But what do you think about the villain's plot here? Are you on, are you on board or does anything fell off to you? Um, I think it's kind of unclear for certain parts of the movie. It feels kind of convoluted. It's like, what is really their plan? It's to free this ancient like squid dragon from its crystal prism in, in space? Um, which is kind of out there. It's like, these are... <laughs> These are ex Nazi um, sorcerers. Guy wants to free the squid, like Cthulhu as character from its space prison to destroy the world. I mean, if you're asking me, you're asking the wrong guy. Because I I thought that's what we're doing here too. Do I get it? No, I don't get it either. To be honest with you. Yeah, I. Uh, funny enough, I think that. I think that Rasputin's plot is clearer in the book. And mm-hmm. I think, you know, the main uh, monster character is a overarching character in the book as well. Um, because they're not like a squid character. They're, they're dragons in the comic, right? I think they're like seven dragons. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and, I think so. And so it's it's different. Like, we don't really get to see the character when he unleashes it as well. We just, like, get to see the tentacles. And then, of course, spoiler, um, Hellboy stops it at the last minute, and then that's the last we see of that character. It just kind of goes and disappears in the dust. Um, So, yeah, I don't know. I think his plan is very unclear for most of the movie. It's just kind of like, hey, we need you. You're the key to opening the portal. But he also is collecting these other things and collecting information throughout the movie. It isn't always clear what his plan is. Dude, it. I don't know if you feel this way or not. It, it, it did. Did we spend way too much time on the Samael character? Because man, it sure felt that way to me. I think so, and I. I think sometimes it's unclear what is the difference between the Samael character and its offerings that are like in a small eggs. Mm-hmm. I, I think there's also bits of this where the creatures look the same, like, uh, because the the. The the creature they're trying to flee free is the I'm probably gonna mispronounce this the Ogdru Jihad right Ogdru Jihad yes um but when he fails to free him um Rasputin dies and then like this other like tentacled creature crawls out of him the behemoth and it's like well wait he failed but there's still a giant tentacle monster anyway. <laughs> Yeah, no kidding. Yeah. Um, and so I think that at, at points that makes it unclear. Um, and you're right. It's like the Sam Samuel character doesn't feel like it has a connection to either. It's just yeah. kind of like a plot. Well, not even a plot device. Like, cause he has a, he has a bigger role in the books, but he just kind of feels like a character that appears at several points in a movie so that Hellboy has something to punch. <laughs> yeah, he's got something to punch. Yeah, there are several points where yeah, where he shows up and he has like these extended fight scenes with Hellboy. And they're entertaining, but it's just kind of like, but why is he there? Yeah, j- well, you just said it, so he's got something to punch. <laughs> um, 
I don't know if I knew this, but the roots of Samael actually point to something previous. Um, Samael is a uh, is a is a character, I guess I I can say from literature. Yes, and he's an angel. Yes, and it, it's really I honestly I don't know if I knew this to be honest. I mean he's. There's different words, uh, Samael, which uh, in uh, Arabic, uh, see, means venom, poison of God. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, what do you think about about tying characters back? I mean, and I'm not as up on my Hellboy comics as you are, but like, is Samael from the books also? Yes. Um, yeah, I think that's one of the cool things about the books is that. Uh, Magnolia would take things from real folklore or real life, uh, real life characters and make them into a part of the mythology of Hellboy. So it always mm-hmm. feels like it's tied back to real things. Like it's tied to like Japanese mythos or like, you know, uh, Celtic stuff and like all this other stuff that is, that has origin somewhere else. Like even, like even Grigory Rasputin is based off a real person. Mm, yeah, no, yeah, for sure. I knew that bit. Um, but Samael is an archangel in Talmudic and post-Talmudic lore, a figure who is the accuser or adversary, seducer and destroyer. In this movie, he's just a big, you know, octopus-looking guy with tentacles and stuff, and like crazy dreadlocks. I guess is what that's supposed to be. I mean, T- tentacles, four eyes, uh, yeah, big like tongue and like weird squid, squid like poison darts. Yeah. Um. Yeah, I mean, it's a cool, it's a, it's a cool, uh, practical creation. Um, I think mm-hmm. that there's a lot of cool things about this movie. Is a lot of practical stuff that, uh, Del Tormo does. Um, Agreed. But, yeah, you don't really get a idea of what this character is. Um, I think again, his character is more clear in the books. Um. Well, I was gonna. That was gonna be my next question to you. What do you think about the effects of this film? Because a lot of stuff that just feels. I mean, it's very visceral. It's very real. It's very prosthetic. It's very real world application. And then when they do CG stuff, I real like when her hands light up with the blue flame. I really get taken out of it because you can tell it's not real, and it just doesn't work for me. It kind of feels like they didn't have a great balance here. You know. Um. I think it's a, I think it's a, it's funny that like, this is a, this is a post-millennial movie. Um, but I do feel like a lot of it that you say is taking you out of it is that it's just, it's, it's dated now. Um, this is mm. dated visuals. Like special effects have just moved so fat, far past that period that now um, some stuff in this movie looks a little hokey. Um, like I think a lot of practical stuff aged well, uh, but even some of that you can tell. Like this is a movie that was made almost twenty years ago, um, yeah. and I feel like the special effects you can see it. Like the CG for sure. Like the CG on Hellboy, um, when we first see him and he's and he's baby Hellboy, it's very jarring. Like you said, mm-hmm. um, yeah. But I don't think that is a, I don't think that's a knock at the movie at the time. Um, I just think it's because we've been so spoiled by special effects at this point. Like we've seen so much better um, that it's jarring. And you know, what's funny is that like to this day, the, the, the battle, the dog fights in star Wars from the original, the original new hope still look wonderful to me. I never bump into star destroyer is not real. It's a model dude. I never bump into that. Like, I can't believe all these years later, and I still don't bump into these are models. This is not a, this is not a, this is not CG and ad at on the snow. This is a model, dude. I just don't. They just look so good. So like, yeah. I think there's a way to do it, but like, I don't know, man. Again, maybe that's what you said. It's 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 just dated because of the time, I guess. Yeah, I, I think that's part of it. Like, I think for the most part, Samuel and and a lot of fight scenes with Hellboy still look good. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, because <laughs> uh, I don't, and actually, now that I think about it, I'm not sure if he's ever called Samuel in a comic, but he's based off of a character that's in the comic. 
Mm-hmm. Um, but he also the character also looks different in the comics a little bit. It's not as tentacle like because it's like uh yeah. it's based off of like the the frog characters, I think. Yeah, that's what it is. Nice. I think it's the frog frog character things from Sea Destruction. Well, uh, uh, we never got to numbers here, right? But uh, this movie did, even though critically, it was critically reviewed very well by critics. Um, it did not make a ton of money. The budget was 60 to $66 million. It made $99.8 million. So it did not you know, burn the house down in terms of numbers, which I kind of remembered it being a bigger success than that. But um I don't yeah. know. I mean, in two thousand, even in two thousand four, thirty three million dollar profits not probably not great anyway. Yeah, I think it was just one of those movies that uh, caught a lot of people by surprise. I think that was one of those movies that did very well after its run in theaters. I think it did very mm. well as a movie people saw on TV a lot because it was always on cable TV. I think it mm. did well in the era of you know Netflix when you actually were getting physical movies from Netflix. Uh, and like DVD rental, uh, I would bet not looking at it. I would bet the second movie probably did better box office wise, mm. just based off of the bird of mouth and just how popular the first movie became. It's like kind of a cult classic. Um, so yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, without uh, without looking it up, which I'm now going to do because now I want to know. Um. But yeah, let's see. Hellboy 2, The Golden Army, which was released four years later. Oh, it did a little bit better. The budget jumped up to 82.5 to 85 million, and it made $168 million. Yeah, see? Yeah, I figured that because that by that point, there was that, you, I mean, you say yourself, that's a four year difference. And I think that by that point, Hellboy was, uh, Hellboy was on TV a lot. It was it was uh, one of those genre movies for fanboys like us that like read the books and go to comic cons. At that point, there was a desire to for a sequel. So yeah, because mm-hmm. I, I really think the first one just kind of came out of nowhere. Especially if you were not familiar with the books, um, I feel like that first movie changed everything for people. Because like I told you, I didn't start reading the books until I saw the movie. That's fair. That's fair. Um. Let's talk a little bit about relationships here. Um, the one between Hellboy and Liz is we never really get told what happened, if anything. And we're kind of led to believe that he's always been in love with her, but that maybe she's not ever really returned it the way maybe she he wanted her to. Uh, it's kind of how it feels. Um, what do you think about the relationship between these two and how fun is it that it's so complex and not as straightforward? Uh, I end up, I end up enjoying that. I end up enjoying their chemistry together. Um, but again, it's just one of those things that's kind of jarring if you're used to the book, um, Hmm. because they don't have their relationship in a book at all. They're just kind of like, if anything, it's kind of like a sibling relationship. Mm Hmm. Um, but I think it works here because I I think a big part of the uh the hump to get over for some fans if you're not into the genre stuff if you're just like a casual fan um is getting into the fantastic stuff and so in order to get into the fantastical stuff you need you need the tropes of regular action movies and that's why you need uh. That's why you need the henchman character in this character in this in this movie to be closer to like a uh, henchman that you would see in other action movies. He can't be just like a calculating Nazi character. Um, he has to be like full on high production value action fig- action set pieces. Um, and I and I feel like it would have been very hard to do this, at least in some studio guy's mind, without doing the romance stuff because. You have to. Every action movie at the time, there had to be the romance stuff as well. Um, mm-hmm. And so I think that also helps to humanize Hellboy in this movie a lot as well. And I think for some people, they need that. 
Well, yeah, no, I get it. You're right. I mean, it's just, it's this idea we have to have the prototypical yes. relationship story. Yeah. Yeah. Who, could, who's a, who's a better couple though, in your opinion, Hellboy and Liz or, or Liz and Myers? <laughs> well, I mean, Liz and Myers are kind of like, not really a couple. They're just kind of like this red herring for people um, to do like this almost Beauty and the Beast thing. Like, oh, she'll never go for me <laughs> because I'm ugly and I'm the demon character. She wants to be with a human that's like her. Um, I, I think that it works as a as a love triangle. Again, I feel like it gives it gives uh, casual fans drama to hang on to. I personally don't need that stuff. I think you could have just gone with Hellboy having like an existential crisis like he has in other things, but I get why they went for those kind of tropes in this movie. Yeah, I get that. And it's funny you mentioned Beauty and the Beast because that was Ron Perlman's big break was on TV next to Linda Hamilton <laughs> in Beauty and the Beast. Have you ever seen any of those old shows? Yes. Oh, yes. man. Good. I don't know yeah. how they hold. Do they hold up at all? Probably not. Um, I keep saying one day I'm going to try and um, I'm going to try and go back and watch uh, like Xena or a lot of that stuff from like the action weekend stuff. Like probably not the biggest fan of Kevin Sorbo and his politics at the moment. Yeah, let's but, let's not do that one. But Hercules <laughs> used to be a big thing at one point. Like that was like must see television on the weekends. Like just that two hours of uh, TV of Hercules and Xena. And I sometimes wonder how that stuff is aged. I like Hercules now. Give me Brett Goldstein over Sorbo any day of the week and twice on Sunday. Yeah, that's who Sorbo I like. is. Yikes. Yeah. Give me Brett Goldstein in the MCU Hercules. That's what I want from now on because hey, he's we, amazing. We still have Lucy Lawless. Lucy Lawless is still a, again, a genre icon. Um, so, yeah, if, if anything, I feel like I want to revisit Xena one day and see if it still holds up. And she's still not bad to look at, if I'm being honest right here. I'm just saying. Um, I'm just saying. Uh, how how old were you when you realized that Lucy Lawless was in Spider Man? Uh, now actually, remind me. Do I know she, this? She's uh she's in the scene in the montage scene where, um, they're talking about Spider Man and she's like, uh, "Dude with eight hands sounds kind of hot." Oh my God, is that her? Yeah. Shut up! I did not know that. That's oh, yeah. awesome. Yeah, I, one day I was looking at, it, I was like. Why does she look so familiar? Because her hair is different. Like she's like a goth character, and I was like, but, and then one day I was like, wait, that Lucy Lawless? And I looked it up. And I was like, that Lucy Lawless. <laughs> okay, yeah, I gotta look that up now because I did not know that. Yeah. Oh my God, it is her. Please tell me that she's not in the credits because I don't want her to be in the credits. I don't know, but when I when I noticed it one day, I was like, what? Wait a minute. And I mean, it's like a, it's like a blink and you miss yeah. it cameo. It's like yeah, really? very brief. But That's I've seen that movie so many funny. times. Of course, I know the line. <laughs> of course. That's funny. That's funny. I did not know that. That's awesome. Um, so we talk about relationships here, right? What about. And and I'll be honest with you. The again, Phil, I encourage you to watch the reboot, if only for David Harbor. The cast is really good. Mila Jovovich is in it. I mean, yeah. you know she's great. Ian McShane, for F's sake, come on, man. I mean, he is Trevor in this depiction of Hellboy. He and David Harbor are freaking great together. They're really, really good. Uh, I don't know if they're as good as Perlman. And John Hurt, what do you think about the relationship between between Hellboy and Trevor in this movie? Uh, yeah, I think they're great. I think you really get an idea for the father and son relationship that they built, and um, and so I think by the time that he does die, I do feel like it, like you said, it feels like such a big hit because we really believe in them as this uh, father and son duo. Oh yeah, it's it's yeah, it's very gutting when that happens. Um, I think at its core, this is a good film. I I, I don't see a whole lot I can, I, I I do I do bump into stuff with the plot, 
I do bump into how long they spend on this Sam Isle character. It feels like it's forever on trying to track these things down. I'm like, God, we're still talking about this. And I don't know what moment that hit me. I felt like he was on top of that roof with that kid way too long. There are certain moments that just really started to drag for me. But yeah. like at the heart, it's, I think I really like the story, man. Yeah. I, I do think it's a very entertaining movie. I do think that it is, it is one of those, uh, <laughs> It is one of those byproducts of the time period that was before um, other comic book movies really showed that you could get out there and dive full in into the weird stuff. You didn't have to you didn't have to try and add as much normal stuff as possible to get mm-hmm. casual fans to like it. I think at some point um, Marvel really showed people like, no, you can get out as out there as possible. And if it's good enough, people will watch it. Yeah. Um, and I think that's a part of why the reboot tries to get stick as close to the comics as possible. Uh, one of the things that I think that, again, when you read the books and you get an idea of the scope of, you know, just Hellboy and the world building they, they do, um, I don't think it's as well done in the movies. Um, and I think that was a missed opportunity. Um, I think they spend a lot of time in the cities because, again, that was the comic book movie trope. Everything had to be in these big cities. You had to have all the skyscrapers. You had to have the character brooding on a rooftop. Um, <laughs> so you had to hit all of the all of the trope checklists. But when you read the books, um, a lot of it doesn't take place in metropolitan areas. It takes place in like all of these like uh, castles or like uh, all of these like. I don't know, vaguely different, uh, well, not vaguely, drastically different uh, scenarios than a usual comic book movie. And I think that kind of scared some creators at the time. I could see a studio going like, nah, we got to have him in the city. <laughs> <laughs> right. We got him in the city. We've got to, we got to cloak it in, in shadows. We got to, we can't, no, 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 no. This works for Batman. You got to have him here. I mean, you know, one of the things I sort of, I sort of, my my go to comparison for any comic book costume in a film is take this thing out of the cover of darkness and put it on in broad daylight on a city street. How ridiculous does it look? And that may or may not be fair based on the character. Like I think you could take maybe any version of the bat suit thus far and put it on the sidewalk on the street and it look like a real guy. It just it would look fine. I mean, I can't swear to that, but I would think that's the case. The Iron Man armor, dude, looks tremendous. Even the prop armor that's, I'm sure, plastic. Yeah, that he's looks not. Really good. It, yeah, it looks really good, right? And like the Captain America suit looks like a dude in a suit because it's a dude in a suit. It's not meant to be anything other than that. Yeah. And like a lot of it works. I mean, but to your point, I go back to what you said about Perlman here. It it is a little too perfect. I I agree with yeah. you. He's a little too shiny. I guess. Is yeah, the I, I really think that's 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 definitely one of those retrospect things. I can't see myself in two thousand four watching this movie like, well, he just looks so he looks so good. And it's, but I think that's one of those age things where it's like, I think it's an artistic touch. I think they should have, you know, just made him a little bit grittier, make him you know look less appealing. Um, but yeah, I think you're right. And when I really think about it, man, it just seems, it just feels like we're old. It feels like we've been fans for a long time. Cause I remember, yeah. <laughs> I remember when those set, set images for Iron Man hit the internet and it wasn't the news cycle where it is now, where Marvel movies were the big to do that they are now. And you see set stuff everywhere. Like you had to go to specific sites to see set set pictures. And I remember like when those first hit the forums, I was on forums then, which again makes me feel old because forums don't exist anymore. Right. Um, but I remember being a comic book forum guy and seeing the first images for comic for Iron Man and going, Boy, this looks cheap. Like this looks like he's in a like plastic suit, like and then seeing the first trailer and going, Oh, we were wrong. We were totally wrong. Of <laughs> course. Um, speaking of world building, I'm going to throw this at you because we've not seen universe building with anyone really, except, I mean, there was one bloodshot film, by the way, that film's highly missable. If you missed it, don't watch it. Yeah. Um, Yikes. Family. We're all family. Oh, wait, wrong movie. You're Uh, talking about the Vin Diesel one, right? (laughs) Of course. 
Yeah, I haven't seen it. Uh, okay, but, well, you know, the rumors were that Valiant was going to jump in, not maybe not head first, but that they had big plans for Exo Man of yeah, War. Yeah, they tried. Archer and Armstrong, yeah, yeah. Yeah, when, once Marvel Studios did it and it was seen as a lucrative thing, everybody tried their hand at it. Well, you know where I'm going with this. Why do you think we've not seen an attempt by Dark Horse? And if you if there's an answer, I don't know it. Why do you think we've not seen them attempt to dive in? Is it because of the creator-owned aspect? It would be harder, maybe? I'm not sure. Um, but I think that uh, Hellboy has such a big, vast universe of its own. Mm. And I think one of the mistakes that they made with the reboot is I think that Hellboy would have worked better if they went the boys route and made a TV show and then you can make spinoffs. Ooh. I think it would have been much better because I think you, you give a lot of the plot stuff room to breathe. You give yourself room to do all of the world building. Like that would have been cool if like you could get somebody like Netflix or uh, Amazon to buy it on a Hellboy TV show and then spin out of it like a BPRD show. I mm. think that could work. Bureau of Paranormal Research and Defense, which is great because we all know that if any of this were real the government would absolutely have to have an agency for it yeah i mean that's that may be the most realistic thing in this whole movie the government would be in charge of it because yeah. it totally would of course um yeah uh, another other one of weird things too is that they treat hellboy like he is a he's a, a myth in the in the movies and perfect perfect and I, I like that part about it, but in the comic, he's he's like well known. He's he's out in the public, um, but I I really like that monologue, not monologue, the montage we get of like the the newspaper clippings and all of the grainy footage of him. I think all of that stuff is cool. Hundred percent, and I love your idea of a streaming show. And dude, if you want to spin a movie out of that later, you can, right? Yeah, I, I think there's so much room to do something interesting with that. Like even if you're just doing movies direct to a streaming platform. I can't believe nobody has thought of that idea. Like there's there in the world of, you know, everybody looking for an IP for streaming and content is like gold right now. I feel like there's so much content you can make out of Hellboy. And I'll be honest with you, he won't do it. He won't do it. But and and I'm not gonna say he should have been instead of David Harbour, because that, that ship has sailed. But if you're gonna do a streaming series Honestly, I say you cast Dave Batista, do 10 episodes. I think he'd be tremendous. I mean, he's still in fantastic shape. He's got the perfect attitude for it. He's got a sense of humor, but he's tough. I Dude, I could totally see that happening. Yeah, I, I think it would be a good way to have him re, re, uh, reprise the role. I think he would be definitely up for it because he seemed to really enjoy playing the character. Um. I think I would love to see them do like a tonal shift though and not do as much of the comedy release if they did the TV show. I would love it if they mm. stuck to it, stuck to what the book is and make it mysteries. Because um, mm. I think that's a big compelling part about the books. But again, that's just me. I think, man, it's so hard because once you delve into the books and like you understand why this turned into a success. It's like, man, why didn't you guys just do that? Like, that's always one of my gripes with Batman. It's like, why don't they just do like detective stuff with him? Like, that's the thing that I, I enjoyed about Batman as a kid. But I, again, it has to, it has to be a blockbuster movie. So you have to make it this big action movie. It can't be like this, uh, slow plotting detective movie that has some fight scenes in it here and there. Okay, let me ask you this. If you don't cast David Harbour or Batista or Ron Perlman and you're going to do a streaming series, who do you cast as Hellboy if you're going to do the, the style of show that you want to do? I mean, he still has to be entertained, though. You still have to give him some kind of comedic edge, but just stick more to the supernatural thriller instead. Who could you cast now? That's a tough one. Yeah. A part of me does want to see David Harbour get another another swing at it because his movie just did so poorly and it seemed like he was enthusiastic mm -hmm. about the project. Yeah. Um, yeah. I don't know. If you don't go with them... That's who I'm thinking. Yeah, I'm sitting here thinking myself. Um, 
somebody, because I mean, it's got to be somebody tall. You a five foot five is not going to cut it here. You need someone big, because you can put them in in boots with lifts, but that's still not going to cut it. You need someone big, man. Yeah. Uh, hmm. Yeah, no, no. Because I mean, even if you don't do the lifts, um, like give them the goat legs. Come on, man. Get get it. <laughs> <the> goat legs. <laughs> You're gonna die on that hill, aren't you? The goat legs. It was goat legs in the in the reboot. <laughs> oh man, uh, that's good. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Man. Yeah, I, don't, I can't think of somebody off the top of my head. Um, it's so weird because I think that uh, I think that Harbor is perfect. Um, I think that yeah. when you look at him and like when you like his voice and everything, he he's really perfect casting. They just it kind of sucks that that movie ended up being bad. Oh well, listen, watch it and you'll know why. Uh, I'm, yeah, uh, I've heard. I've heard all of the. <laughs> I've heard all of the problems with it. Uh, but if if you hold him up in the suit next to Perlman, it's pretty darn good yeah. in terms of who Hellboy maybe is for the movie genre. Anyway, it's pretty darn good. So I think you'll enjoy him. Yeah. Um. We're not going to get into part two here, kids. We may never... I don't know. Maybe we'll cover part two. We've done part one, Phil. Uh, get, I've, caught, I've talked myself into it already. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, we did the first hangover, so ah, we might as well do the other two. Uh, we don't have to get too much into it, but really quick, why did this movie work and the, and the second one didn't? But see, I, I enjoy the second movie. I think that the second movie yeah. leans too heavy into the romance stuff, and it leans too heavy into the cartoonish stuff. Um, and I think this one works better because it does a better balancing act. Mm-hmm. Um, but I enjoy both movies. I think both movies are entertaining. I think there are some cringy scenes in the second movie, um, but I mostly enjoy it as well. I, I mean, um, as much as I'm saying that the I didn't need the romance stuff. I feel like the cliffhanger of uh, him having twins was enough to be to make me think, okay, where's this third movie? I've been wanting the third movie because that's a good hit cliffhanger. Mm-hmm. Well, now we have to do part two. <laughs> uh, I've taught myself into it, and then you helped me. Um, I, I think this movie stands alone. I, I it. You're right. He really wanted to make part three, and the rumor of part three was uh, was around for yeah. years, and it never happened. And yeah, I think it's I think it's pretty much dead. Uh, oh, you know who I thought of, just thought about who might be an interesting Hellboy. Um, hmm. uh, you seen you seen Sicario, right? Snipe white actor, Puerto Rican guy that's in it. Del Toro, ben- Benicio del Toro, Benicio del Toro, the collector yeah. might be interesting as a Hellboy. Dude. Dude, love it. Freaking love it. Because he didn't need any makeup. I'm he just teasing. Makeup. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just teasing. Dude, I, he is so good. He is, oh my God, he's so yeah, good. He's, he's great yeah. in Sicario. I don't know if you've ever seen that movie, but when I when I think of that guy, oh, I always think of Sicario's excellent, underrated movie. Uh, who was in No Country for Old Men? Uh, can't remember his name. I have a. For some reason, he just jumped into my head. I have as well. Brolin stuck in my head now because Brolin is also Josh. Ooh, Brolin. Josh Brolin. He's also in uh, Sicario with him. Uh. Oh my God! I want Josh Brolin now. I changed my mind. Uh, Javier Bardem. Ah, right, there you go. Yeah. Oh man, why is Josh Brolin not Hellboy? Yeah, I think he he could also do a great Yikes. job at that. That voice that he did as Cable, shut up. Yeah, I wonder. <laughs> I wonder if he's going to be back for a cameo in Wolverine. In, well, not Wolverine, but Deadpool three. Wolverine on the brain now. I'd be shocked. I think he'll be there. He'll be shot. I'll be shocked if he's not. Yeah, I feel like Honestly. he has to have like a, a brief cameo. Yeah. Well, before we get off on Wolverine and Deadpool, which we'll cover when that happens, uh, kids, there is. Hellboy. Um, yes, you have part two to look forward to. Uh, so we'll see uh, when and where you get that little ditty delivered. 
but uh, as Phil said at the beginning of this thing, this is an entertaining movie. It works on a lot of different levels. It works in ways maybe it shouldn't work. And then in moments where it maybe it should work, it kind of falls just a little bit short. But overall, I, I, I don't know. Do I say A on this movie or a strong B plus? I think I'll go strong B plus. Uh, I really enjoy this movie and it, I think it does hold up some of the effects and whatever. But again, that's as to Phil's point earlier, we're so jaded by years and years and years of the MCU and Star Wars movies who have the effects look even better than they did in the originals. And to me, those still hold up in my opinion. And, um, yeah, you can pick anything apart hard enough kids if you really want to. Uh, so yeah, um, Phil, let's uh, try to do this thing justice here at the end. What is your last word on Hellboy? Uh, I think that Hellboy is a cult classic in some ways. I think it came at the, I think it came at the right time, uh, coming out of the boom of creator-owned comics in the '90s, and it was right at the cusp of of comic book movies becoming like the biggest, most lucrative thing in Hollywood. Um, in some ways it feels like this thing is embarrassed of its <laughs> source material. Um, but I feel like it's still a very entertaining movie. Um, even if you're not like a Hellboy fan, even if you are one of those, Oh, the comics are better guys. Um, it's hard to not like Ron Perlman in this role. He's just so likable. Um, and I feel like his performance, if anything makes this movie versa watch. Yeah, for sure. And I mean, we all can sit back and, and, you know, lament the fact that this didn't turn into an amazing trilogy or maybe even four or five sets, uh, four or five movies. Cause the cast seemed to be on par. Perlman was perfect as we said, but you know, sometimes kids, you take one movie or maybe the pair alone and you just are happy with that. And then you can always go back and watch it. As we've said before, you don't like a reboot. You don't have to watch it again. <laughs> Give it a chance or don't give it a chance. It's up to you. No one took away the original unless you're George Lucas, which was still a dick move. I, in, in my summation, uh, but it's okay. I got copies of the original trilogy, so I'm always going to be good. Um, but there you have it, kids. That is Hellboy. Again, you still got it. Go back and watch it and stay tuned for part two. Cause as I said, I've already taught myself into it. Uh, so yeah, enjoy it. If you haven't watched it, for God's sake, watch it. If you haven't watched it in a while, go check it out. Enjoy. And that is Hellboy. Hey, thanks for listening to the show. Check out our social media on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram at 6 Podcast. We'll see you next time.